Hi everyone, my name is Lisa and I've been a practitioner for PMLD or children for quite a long time now um, and I'm here to talk to you about sensory journeys. So a sensory journey is quite a unique technique um, for telling a story or an event or a theme or through music, props and creating that whole sort of sensory experience for the group that you're working with. Um, it removes the need for language. There is no spoken words throughout this session at all. And um, that's why it's, I think, quite unique in that sense. Um, the sensory journey is, um, it removes that need to understand language. Um, but it's accompanied by lots of props, which I'm going to share with you here today, um, and some of the paperwork and sensory journeys that I'm going to talk about will be available for you to have a look at as well. Um, it's really designed for an individual um, to work on that symbolic representation of something. So it's, you know, stories, events, themes are really sort of broken down into very sort of six or seven key stages. Sometimes it can be longer. It really depends on how long you want your sensory journey to be. Um, and it's all about different sensory stimulation um, and you know targets can be set around that and I can talk about objectives a little bit later on. So um, we're going to talk about the methodology behind the sensory journey first of all and then we will have a look at um, creating a sensory journey and looking at some sensory journeys. So looking at the methodology behind a sensory journey, um, your environment should be as dark as you can possibly get it. Um, and that then makes the emphasis on the music that is being played or the props um, that you are offering the child, enabling any children with visual impairments to really focus down on the simulation at hand. Um, students with hearing impairments um, can experience music through resonance boards if that's easier for them um, or they can have some headphones on to, to make it louder for them but music is played quite loud throughout a sensory journey. Um, you should make sure your children are in as comfortable position as possible. It's quite nice to get them out and in a relaxed state, so pea pods, bean bags, mats on the floor, somewhere where they're really comfortable and can relax into this experience and can fully experience it in every step of the way. Um, we try to have one-to-one -one for this session, but I do appreciate that's not possible for, for everybody. Um, so one-to-two is absolutely fine, but you need to make sure that every child has a single version of the prop. So you're not sharing props between two children. They do have one set of props for each child. While children are out in a relaxed state and um, in their bean bags or pea pods or mats, shoes and socks are removed at the uh, within the beginning of the session and things also so we will be exploring different parts of the body, hands, feet, legs. So with that in mind, we try not to put them in equipment such as standing frames and um, gate trainers so that we can access all parts of their body throughout. So there is a typed plan for each sensory journey um, and again you can see those um, in some of the handouts that will be available. Um, there is a definitive plan of what comes first and the um, way that the sensory journey unfolds but also it will have a list of props, uh, a list of where those props will be uh, used on the body and also the music that will be used for the, uh, the that prop and the length of time that prop is being used. Um, I would always warn the students, I mean it's practice that we all do all the time, but warn the students when the lights are going off um, and get it out as they're getting ready and comfortable into their areas. Obviously make sure everybody is safe um, getting to these areas when, when uh, the lights go off and it goes very dark. So just before you uh, start a sensory journey, you make sure everybody is in their positions ready to go in their bean bags or their mats or whatever it is that you're using. And then you would make sure that your adults are all in position and ready. And then one member of your team will go over to your light switch and turn the lights off, obviously warning the children that your lights are going off. And at that point, 
those are the last words that are spoken throughout the sensory journey. It will be lights going off or whatever it is that you use to cue the children in that lights are going off. And then there are no more words spoken until the end of the session when it would probably be something like lights going on. Um, obviously, if a child becomes upset or distressed with it, with, uh, within the session, then the member of staff that's with them would talk very quietly to them um, and, you know, deal with it as you can, as quietly as possible. Um, because obviously, if there's an emergency, you need to deal with it. And that's that's what it is. So I would also uh, say that at the start of the sensory journey, there is a sound cue. I like to use um, a little bell. Uh, it's something quite different to what we use as other cues within the classroom and in, within the school. So it would be, um, I would say, lights going off. And that would be the audio cue for uh, children to know that a sensory journey is starting. We talked about music playing loudly and music will be blasted out um, as loud as you can in the classroom or as loud as children can take it in the classroom. I appreciate that some children can't handle loud music. So um, we try to fill the space with each song or piece of music that is being played. During each track, the member of staff manipulates the sensory prop in a way that the child will get the most out of that sensory input. And remember to give the child enough time to respond to the sensory stimulation. They can really enjoy it, reach out for it, reach, track, hold, manipulate it themselves, enjoy it, push it away, they don't like it. Facial expressions, body language, vocalisations, all of that is fine, it's great and that's what we want to do. We really want to encourage that communication um, around likes and dislikes. Um, and see how they can uh, explore the sensory uh, input that we're giving them. So now onto the really exciting bit, creating your own sensory journey. Um, so this is where you have to decide what story, event, theme you want to do. I've done the Olympics, I've done packing in a factory, I've done really well-known stories like Wind in the Willows and Charlie in the Chocolate Factory which I'm going to show you a little bit later on, maybe a few others, um, and it's just deciding on breaking down those components, what are the main messages of the story that you want to convey to your children, um, and once you have that and you've broken it down into, as I said before, six to eight um, different areas of your story, and then you can look at what you could use as a prop, as a sensory stimulation for that part of the story. So I tend to think of different sections of the story first of all um, and break it down and then you can think of different pieces of music. Now the idea is not to have all pop music, not to have all classical music, so there are definitely real different rhythms and tones and genres of music throughout the sensory journey. Um, it sets that lyrical content, the, um, sets the mood for it, and it will really fill that space within your classroom or your ball pool or wherever it is you're um, planning to do a sensory journey. Now you just need to decide on what kind of props you want to do to represent this part of the story. Um, you can choose um, lots of different props to represent things, um, very really tactile ones, and then look at what part of the body you want this sensory journey to, to be on as well, what's the best place for this sensory stimulation to be. You also then need to choose the sound of which you want to start your session with, something that's different from everything else you use in your curriculum. So it's really distinguished for these children to recognise after a period of time that this is the start of their sensory journey. And then that sound will be used for the start of all sensory journeys, no matter what the topic, the event or the story is based on. So let's get to some sensory journeys that I have used in the past and they've worked really well. Um, so I'm going to start with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which is a favourite one of mine um, to use with the children, mainly because a lot of the smells um, is really good for the children and they really enjoy it. So I would start with um, pure imagination. So what I would do is I would get all the children down in their bean bags and their pea pods, mats, IKEA chairs, um, whatever it is we're using for different children, and I would play pure imagination. Hold your breath. 
which is actually from the Charlie and Chocolate Factory musical, which is always helpful. And while this is playing, I would be making sure the children are comfortable, even though it's now dark. Um, and I would be taking off their shoes and their socks, um, just giving their feet a little touch and a little massage, not a real sort of deep massage, but just a rub and reassuring the children that you're there. You can do that with their hands if they're feet sensitive. Um, and again, just letting them know you're there for the duration of the song. So if I was doing this as a sensory story, I would start with Charlie Bucket and his family and being poor and having something to represent that being poor. But we only have a few stages with a sensory journey. So I'm going to start with our golden ticket. And I would play Walking on Sunshine for this, um, just as a thing with a bit of beat to it, slightly different to Pure Imagination, gets us going, gets us moving. And also I would use the bit of yellow paper, somebody can use something shiny, it would be really nice for those with visual impairment, um, but something you can scrunch up, you can unfold and use, you can even shine a light on it, and it's just really something interesting my children really enjoy doing, exploring scrunched up pieces of paper. So as I say, we can, we, I've chosen Walking on Sunshine for for that particular area of the sensory journey. So the next one, what can I think, what comes next? What's the most important part of the story? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the most important part of the story, but just like those bits where you think I can find a sensory prop for that, or this will help tell the story. So we are gonna go and meet Mr. Willy Wonka. Now he's fantastic, he's magical, um, he's a very wealthy person. So I've chosen Price Tag by Jesse J for that. Again, a different feel, different tone of music, and it is something, um, again, that will set that mood. And I've chosen for Mr. Willy Wonka a piece of really sparkly material that um, you can wave over the children, they can feel it, um, it catches the light really well, so again, you can bring your torch in if you need to. Um, with it being so dark in the room, you can shine a torch on it, you can shine a torch through it. Um, and it will show, uh, it, that's the representation of him being very rich and very magical, which is uh, really part of Willy Wonka's character. So um, we have looking at entering the factory now. So this is quite exciting for our characters entering the factory. And I am going to be using some vanilla scented bubbles because it's quite amazing when they walk in and they see all these different um, different things. So I have chosen upside down. It's a bit different, again, a different beat, a different way of um, filling that, uh, that space. And in just an ordinary set of bubbles, I have put some vanilla essence in there for um, essential oil, vanilla essential oil. And I use something like this, which hopefully um, you can buy in a lot of shops now, like B&M's and places like that. And it blows tiny, tiny little sort of touch of bubbles. So uh, we will see if it works. So it's lots and lots of tiny little bubbles floating around the room, floating around the air, around the children. And as you can see, they stay in the air for absolutely ages. You can see, I'm sure now throughout the whole of the filming this, there will be bubbles floating all around me because they stay in the air for absolutely ages, which is great fun. Um, if you need any um, way you can pick up these things, uh, like the little bubble blower or um, anything else that I talk about on here, then please do um, just let me know and I can try and remember where I bought things from uh, and let you know. Amazon is always a friend as well. Um, so there are lots of bubbles sticking to me, uh, so I do apologise um, if bubbles are sticking to me. Uh, so my next bit of the story would be about um, Augustus falling into the chocolate river. 
Um, so he, I would choose a chocolate massage lotion if you can. Um, I did have a body butter from the body shop, but they can be really expensive. So what um, you can do is choose an unscented body lotion, um, which are fairly easy to get hold of. And this would be sort of massaged into their children, children's hands and what you can do to add sort of that chocolate smell to it is to get some of these sort of nasal inhalers um, from Amazon so thank you Richard Hurstwood for telling me about these um, and you can sort of take them apart um, and put in your own smell into the inside of it so you can buy some chocolate essential oil or some chocolate food flavoring um, and you can then waft it under the child's nose, put it away, see what their response is. Um, and so if you can't get any sort of chocolate hand lotion, then I would suggest getting some of these nasal ones um, and putting a chocolate smell in. It works really well. Um, and for that one, I have a different piece of music. It's called On a Dark Night, and it's actually from the Aladdin soundtrack. But it just was something really different to sort of for me I was listening to lots of different music and I wanted something that would sort of be like a flow of a river you may you could use a river song um, you could use any kind of music that would make you think of a river um, or you could use a song that had chocolate in it but as long as it was slightly different to the other music that he had been using move on to Violet now she's one for always chewing bubblegum she chews 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 so what I have found is some um, bubblegum shower gel which will really smell like bubblegum it's actually really strong bubblegum flavour um, and again you could I know it's shower gel so you could have a flannel on hand that's quite damp to wipe it off afterwards but you can have a little feel it has a slimy texture and you literally need a tiny weeny bit so you can pass the bottle around or you can decant it um, into and it just rub it into their hands or rub it into your hands and let them smell that bubblegum flavour. You could pour it into the flannel if you wanted to do it that way and just give them that smell and that feeling of the flannel on their hand. Um, but it's quite a strong thing. Again, if you couldn't find a particular bubblegum flavour, although it seems to be everywhere at the moment, uh, again, you could use um, a, a nasal smell. Um, or you could actually buy some bubblegum and get the children to smell it and feel it um, as long as you weren't too worried that they, if they put it in the mouth so obviously you know your children better and you can use something for that bubblegum smell for that particular um, piece of music I had a uh, Claire de Lune actually something completely different just again set in that mood so um, I wanted something that was not about sort of the chewing but was about expanding and this music expands and it grows as it carries on throughout the piece of music. We then come to Veruca Salt who is uh, someone who really wants the squirrel. Um, she gets everything that she wants and she wants the squirrel that are chucking the nuts. So um, I literally just have some squirrel tail material. Um, which is something that I um, bought as off cuts and just cut into sort of strips for tails um, and this is something for the children to feel you can run it up their hands up their arms again you know your children better and it'll be in your plan which part of the body you want to put this on um, and it would be really interesting to see how they react to the, the real soft sort of squirrel tails on that and because the squirrels are so busy um, I have Flight of the Bumblebee for this um, which is a really fast piece of music the squirrels are already really really busy checking all those nuts um, so I wanted a fast piece of music for it to find something for Mike um, because he wants to be shrinking um, and it, um, into the TV that's the, what happens within the story so um, I found these things in Pets at Home which is a tube like this which are used for animals like guinea pigs and rabbits and hamsters and they come in different sizes um, and they're really good for saying they make a really cracking sound um, when you expand them and shrink them down so you can also make lots of sounds by rubbing against them but when you expand it 
and again when you shrink it back down. So again it's quite a good effect for shrinking something down um, to TV size. And you can, again, it's really tactile, you can bend it in different ways, um, it can twist really easily. But it's a great sound. Um, and for that I have a piece of music that's really quite quiet and in the background because these do make quite a lot of noise themselves so you want kind of this to be the music so I just have um, a piece of piano music in the background just playing in the background for those because they are quite loud and when you've got a group of children all exploring them and playing them it can be very loud. And our last section for this sensory journey is the glass elevator and for this I have a very cheesy song of Up Where We Belong and I have um, just some battery operated lights that I would use for this. Again, you can look at it because it's really different and they're in a glass elevator and they can see things. If you have children with um, really sort of severe visual impairments, you could have um, a smooth glass pebble. You could have something that uh, they could feel that's, that's smooth like glass and cold like glass. Um, so they can use that for other children. They can explore the light. Um, you can also use something like a, a bit of bubble wrap to put the lights under. So it's seen as if through glass. And then I would always, always finish your sensory journey with the same piece of music that you started with. So the, the piece of music that you used at the beginning to take their shoes off and make sure they were comfortable, make sure that they were safe and secure in how they were feeling is the same piece of music that you end with, which for this um, Charlie and Chocolate Factory one is uh, pure imagination so you would use that again at the end and that would be when you were putting shoes and socks back on and making sure that they were happy with giving over props and making sure that they were comfortable in their uh, pee pods and whatever else pieces of soft furnishings you've got them in or even their chairs um, and then when you have every member of staff has put shoes and socks back on and everyone's ready and your song has finished you would um, shake your <coughs> bell again or whatever sound cue that you are using um, and then a member of staff would very carefully make their way in the dark over to the light switch and it would be lights going on or whatever cue it is that you're giving um, and then the lights would come on if you have somewhere where you can gradually make the lights come up because your room has been really dark so i have a tendency to pull my blinds up first um, and let natural daylight come in um, because from going from complete darkness right straight into um uh, full-on overhead lighting can be a bit too much for the adults let alone the children so um, just be careful how you uh, arrange light back into your room if you've got a fader switch brilliant uh, if not I would suggest opening blinds first So we're going to finish up with some objectives for sensory journey sessions. So um, you're looking for those communication opportunities, likes, dislikes, responses to sensory stimulation and also building that relationship between the adult and the student. So I would most definitely try and keep the same adult with the same student when you do the sensory session. So I tend to do a sensory session on a Friday um, and I would make sure that the same member of staff would be with the particular child or children for that sensory journey. So um, you are looking for making eye contact with that adult if they can um, and does that increase or does it decrease as the session happens or over a number of weeks when you're doing the same sensory journey for half a term or so. 
Uh, you're looking to that response to sensory stimulation. Is it a positive response? Is it a negative response? Does that develop? Does it change over time? You're looking at showing emerging communication, facial expressions, body language, vocalisations for things that they like, um, things that they're getting more used to as the sensory session goes on, again, over weeks and at time. You're looking at consistency in responses, um, showing emerging choice making, preferences. Are they reaching out for something? Uh, do they smile at the same place in the sensory journey every time? And you're looking, can they explore items independently or with growing independence? Are they reaching? Are they moving towards something that they particularly enjoy? And for other children, we're looking at locating and tracking items. So is it the, uh, not necessarily just the lights that they can track? Um, in one of the Gruffalo sensory stories, I have a spiky ball um, that uh, I use for warts. And is that something they can track on their body? Do they know where it's going to appear after a while? If you're going to roll it sort of from their hand up their shoulders, along their back and down their arms, are they starting to anticipate those kind of activities within the session? All these little sort of things around um, their communication that you can look at. So um, if you have any questions, any comments, any sensory stories um, that you would like me to help you work on with, as I say, I've got quite a few. Uh, I've got a Gruffalo one. I have a Whatever Next one. Um, I have a Wind in the Willows one. Um, and also I've worked on themes, as I said before, about the Olympics packaging. We had a topic on and off. So I did a whole sensory journey about being uh, things that you can switch on and switch off in a variety of different ways. Um, and I've also done sensory journeys um, around things like water and different ways for, for a science um, session actually. So all the different types of water that you can have. Um, so uh, I'm quite happy to work collaboratively um, or if you just want some ideas for if you're stuck in one section, um, just let me know and I'm more than happy to help you develop sensory journeys in your school. Um, and if you do try one, let me know how it goes. Uh, I'd be really happy to hear about that as well. Um, and as I say, have a look at the handouts. I'm gonna put a few sensory journeys in there and also the rationale behind it so you can have a look back and see what the rationale is. Um, and just about remembering, it's about developing that relationship and the communication um, of the children you're working with. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little session about sensory journeys. And I really hope you try them in your class, in your setting, in your school. Um, and even at home, you can use it at home. Just have a little box of props ready at home for, for things that you can do uh, for a particular story. And it's a really way of changing how you explore a story. Um, so I hope you have fun with it and I hope to see you all soon. Take care. Bye bye.